One of my favorite parts of video websites is the occasional rabbit holes they can take you down. A lot of games I've been interested in came from an algorithm suggesting a particular piece of content. In some cases, that's terrifying how a machine is conditioning me to think, but in others, it's pretty awesome, and I would give that machine the crispest high five I could, because most of the time, it's not mainstream video games that are featured in these virtual descents. Instead, smaller games that are strange, odd, and most importantly, are so much more interesting to me. One of these rabbit holes took me to Fear and Hunger, a video game series with two games under its belt at this time of recording. My journey started with an awesome in-depth look by Zoldim before seeing the video that sealed the deal on my interest. Warm Girls Fear and Hunger 2 Termina is indie horror perfection. Both will be linked in the description below if you're curious to check them out. Once I saw the moon, which captured my attention, and the comparison with another RPG Maker game featured on this channel, I knew I wanted to try it. The first game looked fantastic, but the aesthetics of the second and its time of the 1940s had me prioritizing the sequel first. I downloaded the game's demo to understand what to expect. You're about to see that condensed virtual experience of my initial visit to Prehavil. Before we begin, I want to give a heads up that Fear and Hunger is a series that is quite dark in subject matter, often featuring elements that could unnerve the unprepared and tread into some very adult subject matter. The warning when you start the game is no joke. If that's something you're not into, it's all good and feel free to stop watching. But if you're willing to brave this descent into the abyss together, welcome aboard as I relay my initial experience with Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. The first game to have me do this to my player character, willingly. Let's begin. Fear and Hunger 2 currently features 8 playable characters, but for the demo, we have 4 options. Ex-Soldier, Occultist, Doctor, and Engineer. They all seem pretty cool, but I'm going with the Doctor, canonically named Don, but for my playthrough, his name will be Stein. And I've spent not even 5 minutes with him, but I already love this character. Appearance-wise, he looks awesome. I'm getting some Himino similarities with the eye patch, which is a magnificent foot to start on because I love that character. And what draws me in even more is the character info. As you ride the train, you are given an option to hear your character's backstory, one you can skip if you wish. But as a fan of making backstories in Dungeons & Dragons, I'm all for it. Especially when given options to interpret what my character did in their past. Here's what I got. Growing up, Stein's parents were cultists of the deity Sylvan, the being of fertility and creation, and would don their masks unclothed, partaking in acts of faith in the fields. Sylvan would offer gifts of healing at the cost of the mental state of those taking, a boon his parents would prod him to accept, which he despised. No gift was ever truly free, and one day they went into the fields for worship and never returned. To provide for himself, Stein attempted to find honest work, and fate was kind to him, taken under the care of Baron Ethel von Dutch, who taught the boy the arts of nobility, growing an attachment to the Baron's daughter, Elise, who was fascinated with the stories of his past. Stories that piqued the interest of the Baron as well. As a doctor, he was intrigued with Sylvan's power of healing and how it diverged from his experience, a practice that Stein chose to adopt, internalizing the words, to heal, something of equal value must be lost, a phrase that offers Stein the skills of medical and organ harvest. Life had been kind to Stein. He and Elise began to date with the Baron's blessing, but all things must end. The war was afoot, and Stein was sent in as a combat medic. He had seen horrors there, but the letters he would receive made them bearable, until they stopped arriving. He assumed that things were busy at the household, so he held out until he could return. But what met him was something far worse. In the manor basement was the lifeless body of the Baron, with offerings scattered around the room, and it broke Stein's heart when he found the remains of Elise in the darkness. He tried to save her, offering his eye to bring her back, but it was no use. Elise was gone, and Stein was once again alone. He had no past to go back to. All he wanted to know was why. 
In a collection of papers the Baron kept, he wasn't offered that answer, but a lead. A reoccurring name, a town called Prehavil. And so, Stein packed some medical supplies and journeyed to the town, leading us to now. This is what got me to love this character. His backstory is tragic and has me invested, but the opportunity to pick choices during it allows me this personal interpretation of the character and a fun incentive to roleplay. I'm already hooked. I couldn't have expected what would come next. A girl is drawing a symbol in what looks like blood and moves further down the train. Then a pathway is created by luggage, one that I travel down and am confronted by a creature demanding I put together these strange cubes. At this point, I'm thrown off. The game is actually having me put cubes together with the arrow keys, but maybe it's just the tutorial, I'll play along. Though it looks like the girl is here, she encourages me to escape as she travels off screen. And it was in this section that the game showed me who's boss. As I scramble for the exit, I'm confronted by the previously mentioned monster called the janitor, and combat begins. I notice I can attack enemy limbs, so I target his arm holding a weapon, but he quickly bodies me. And then, to make sure I'll have a hard time leaving, he does this. This is when I went, okay, this game doesn't mess around. He fetches other supplies, so I drag myself across the bloodied floor, further into the workshop until the map changes to a mess hall housing significant figures sitting side by side, their intentions unknown, but I am displaced again. I appear on a tower, the sky a blackened sheet of darkness cut through by the green hue of the twisted moon. A devout follower waits for me to get my footing before speaking. He's the figurehead of the moon, his mouthpiece brought to life. The moon is the trickster deity Rahir, and has given me my legs back as a show of good faith before sharing his purpose for bringing us here. The Festival of Termina is about to commence, an opportunity to pull the curtain of cosmic grandeur, and he has selected 14 of us to participate, but only one will matter in the end. And with that, we are sent back to the train, which has suddenly stopped. Some passengers are waiting outside, trying to figure out what to do, but what caught my attention was out of the 14 passengers, there's only seven outside, myself included. A few people seem to be trying to keep everyone together, some are indifferent, and some can't be bothered. A girl wearing a brown jacket begins throwing accusations that one of the passengers, a soldier from the Bremen army, must know something because they left right when the train stopped, even suggesting some experimentation with the military. As a practitioner of medicine, I chime in that sounds a bit far-fetched, which causes her to get pretty hostile with me, but eventually the conversation ends and the game can officially begin. Now, we've just started and I'm already into this. We have an interesting cast of characters, all doing their own things, all thrown into this with no idea what's happening. All except one person. One of the characters, a man garbed in yellow cloth, is familiar with the festival and has willingly taken part in it when asked about it. A unique touch I enjoy quite a bit. It makes the fellow participants fleshed out, each with pieces of information unknown to the other. But I've lingered around this train long enough. I need answers, so I make my way south, taking time to salvage supplies from abandoned buildings since my character has a variety of bars to keep track of, from hunger, body, and mind. Body seems to be my health bar, hunger is its own thing, and mind seems like a mental damage bar. But upon walking into the next zone, a villager gets axed by a Rasputin looking character donning a coat. The man is above my abilities and I've only got a scalpel to defend myself, so I hightail it out as the crazy man readies his axe for another blow, saying, Termina is upon us. Feeling incredibly slick for disengaging from the potential disemboweling, I explore the Old Town section, taken back by how oppressive the game feels. The fog encasing the corners of the screen, the weathered textures on the ground in buildings, and the droning music all make me feel like a meek survivor rather than an all-powerful player character. But it's not all bad. When exploring the woods, I battle a pair of dogs. They don't have any teeth, so the only way they attack me is to chomp me with their toothless maws, or to upchuck, which actually stings quite a bit. But I emerge victorious in the end. 
and things begin to look even better after finding a hatch. One of my fellow passengers, the mechanic, appears looking for parts of the train, so we journey inside together. Once we arrive underground, she introduces herself as Abella and becomes a party member. The company is undoubtedly appreciated. Things are looking up. And I can already imagine the game rubbing its hands, rendered in its beautiful yet haunting art style as it prepares for the humbling experience of a lifetime. This kicks off right when I journey deeper underground and meet a man named Needle. Waltzing up to Abella and me, wielding a needle whip in one hand and a syringe in the other. With the two of us, I assumed we could deal with them no problem. I was wrong. My character wakes up chained by the ankle. It seems death is not ready for Stein yet, but Abella is gone. After some time in a particular event that's pretty surreal, I end up at a different section of Old Town, with villagers clutching their eyes, seeing something so eldritch their eyes broke before their minds did. But avoiding the most hostile villagers, I end up at the Mayor's Manor, a large, barely lit building abandoned. Or so I thought. One of the passengers I met earlier is here, the blonde man with the brown vest. I tried talking to him, but his eyes dart around the hall. He keeps mentioning how hungry he is. I hate to say it, but I can't help him now. And no one could help me with my first mistake. On the right side of the hall, a dark priest meditates in a ritual circle. As I walk past, he takes notice of me and gets up. I take some time to loot the room directly up and loop him towards the nearby door. But it's locked. So I panic and trap myself in a corner, and combat begins. Considering this dude is twice my height and I'm at low health, I decide to bail and get out of there. My attempt works. However, it's here that I'm boned. Because even if you succeed in the check, you have to move your character away from the enemy ASAP. But since I trapped myself in the corner, I can't get out. Eventually, I get demolished with a hurling spell and am defeated. But instead of an immediate game over, I'm treated for my viewing horror, my character getting crucified by the Dark Priest, Father Oscar, as he prays in spiritual bliss at my misfortune. Then I get the game over. At this point, I'm about 30 minutes in, and unfortunately, I didn't save, so I now have to redo all of my progress. But rather than getting upset at this, I appreciate it, more than just having an insane story ready when I talk to my friends about the game but because the game's setting and difficulty aren't pulling any punches. Fear and Hunger 2 Termina is a game that's upfront with what it is, a struggle that will punish inexperience, which sucks in the short term, but will be the most impactful teacher in the future. If you die, it makes sense because the town of Prehavil is so oppressive and bleak. It's expected that you'll kick the bucket a few times. You'll figure it out eventually. So I redid the character backstory in intro section, but this time avoided losing my legs. And once the group cutscene plays, I immediately run back into the train and find this seat that looks like the perfect place to rest up. Once I do so, I'm back in the tower and can save my game. Now that I have a save point, I have a good baseline to progress without going so far back when I die. And die, I did. Many times. I would like to share a few. When fighting a villager, I cut his arm off and then got slammed so hard with his other hand it killed me. As I explored a shack, I found a bed and decided to sleep in it to hopefully gain some health, but as I did, I was awoken by heavy breathing as the woodsman was towering over me. Combat begins and as I plead with him to let me go, he agrees by detaching one of my arms from my body before killing me with another slam. Remember those toothless dogs I mentioned earlier? Well, they got the last laugh. As I felt very smug about my abilities, one of them pulled a Himino and I died from it. When exploring the underground tunnels, for some reason Abella wasn't there to join me this time. I brushed it off as my goal was to kick Needle's ass, starting with his stupid hand holding the whip. At low health, I pull off a critical hit and slash his arm with my scalpel several times before the arm tumbles to the ground. Aha! I proudly exclaim, assuming the fight will now be a cakewalk. And in a move that cracks me up even as I write this, Needle responds by laughing, pulling out a gun, and shooting me. At least the game's got a sense of humor. <laughs> and my personal favorite, while not technically a death, it's the funniest of the fail states. In the map's Old Town section, there's an outhouse with four toilets. If you examine them, you'll have the option to jump down. So I began thinking, oh heck yeah, I've played a video game. There may be an underground pathway that will interconnect like the other sections of the game. So I jumped down, only to find myself surrounded by walls of human waste. Seeing it's a dead end, I make my way back up, but it's too slippery. 
I can't climb up. To recap, I jumped down a toilet and found myself surprised when it was just a hole and trapped myself until I loaded a save. <laughs> this game is great. But it wasn't all bad. Each attempt taught me something about the game. Deaths from the villagers taught me to go for both arms ASAP. The lesson that the only real safe bed was the train seat clicked with me when I experienced the same mistake at the mayor's house. I found a small key and napped in the master bedroom. Waking up to the sound of, hey, what are you doing here? And the toilet debacle reminded me that while there are horrors of cosmic proportions, not all logic was thrown out the window. And the needle encounter made an accidental realization click. I was wondering why Abella didn't show up and why needles seemed to be waiting for me rather than sawing off the head of one of the unfortunate souls. But after a few attempts, I got it. It's because of time. When you rest, in addition to having the option to save and level up, the day progresses, which will change how events play out. Remember, there are three days until the festival is over, so each save counts. That was why Abella wasn't there, and why the other passenger didn't die. Because I wasn't there at the time, it didn't happen. And that theory was confirmed when I went to the mayor's house. I was informed by a kind villager the only way to get deeper into the town was by obtaining two keys. An eagle key rumored to be held by the Burman army in the forest, and the lion key by the mayor. I figured the latter would be easier to get, so I arrive at the manor and am surprised when a towering butler awaits me. His name is Jeeves, and he's pleased with my visit. You see, a new mayor has taken his post and wants to chat with newcomers. I'm directed upstairs, and a hulking figure eagerly awaits me. It's time for dinner, and he asks me to sit down. Seeing as he could rip me in half if given a reason, I choose to comply. And as he chats with me, talking about how he's a newcomer and discussing the villager cuisine, I make a connection. This is the blonde guy from the train. His clothes are identical, and in that previous attempt, I came here to find him at this location. The other participants might be affected like this as time continues. But thankfully, while scary looking, the mayor is a charming conversationalist and gives me the lion key as thanks. What a guy. At this point, I do something incredibly dumb that is pretty funny in retrospect and summarizes my experience. The most powerful thing in Fear and Hunger is wisdom the awareness to understand what's around you and respond in whatever way is appropriate, but you'll make plenty of mistakes along the way to get there. And it's that trial and error that makes the game incredibly rewarding. I suggest to anyone wanting to try Fear and Hunger 2 Termina or its demo, go into it without a guide. The solutions and mental mappings you achieve make the experience, tempered by frustration and defeat, immensely satisfying. The connections are your own, and you should be proud of them, however small they appear at first glance. I'm telling you this to highlight the importance of failure and stalling before revealing my huge mistake. The time I sawed my character's arm off for nothing. Once I said goodbye to the mayor, I found a small shack with a ladder descending underground. Upon arriving, I took a few steps before coming across one of the playable characters, the soldier Levi. He seemed troubled, but ran into the darkness when I asked if he was okay. So I chase him, then am taken aback when I see the ritual circle on the ground, a symbol dedicated to the new gods. However difficult it is for Stein to agree, getting on their good side might be a smart idea. So I make an offering, but I have nothing to give. I read a nearby tome that an offering must be worthy to appease them, and then I notice the bone saw down the hall and an arm. The person is gone, so I try offering this, but it's not worthy. So I get an idea. It's not worthy because it's someone else's. To make an excellent gift, I should willingly give up my own. If that's not dedication, I don't know what is. So I open my inventory, select the bone saw, decide a missing arm would be more manageable than losing a leg, and my character, with a commitment I commend, saws his arm off without much trouble. And then I walk over to the circle. Apparently, I wasn't the only one who found this hilarious, as a villager decides to one-up me by giving me a joke to die for. Alright, that was pretty good. But contrary to the dismemberment, I was getting better at the game. I found a bear trap and wanted to settle the score with the woodsman. So I planted the trap, baited him to come over, then attacked him once he was crippled. It took a few attempts, but once I realized his weak point, 
I slapped the top of his head and victory was mine. Then out of spite, I took a nap in his bed. And additionally, I used Stein's unique abilities. Remember how I got the skills Medical and Organ Harvest in the intro? So it turns out that anytime I kill a humanoid, I can take one of their organs, and each one can cure a particular status condition, making many adverse effects easy to fix thanks to the generous contributions of my opponents. I'm unintentionally playing the hair specs from Pathologic. Cool. But as peachy keen as that is, the game decided it's time for another slice of humble pie when I headed underground again, hoping to find the bird key. When I descended, I realized I need to grab the gas cans scattered in the tunnels, then use the generator. So I walked towards a familiar location, ready to fight Needle, only to realize he's no longer there, which I'm cool with, but I would gladly swap back with what's in its place. I transferred the gas cans to the generator and heard a loud booming sound. That's strange, but whatever, I thought as I made my way to the elevator. Only for a monster to rush towards me and make my heart nearly jump out of my chest. I died quite a lot to them. They have three attacks, one that will kill you if they do it two times, and pommel. Twice. And the worst part? I remembered where I saw those red overalls before. I can't take her on to fight, so I decide to explore the town and find a different solution besides the bird key. And to my surprise, I had one. I walk over to the gate blocking the inside of the town for me, clicked through the dialogue about the keys, then noticed the option to use bolt cutters to bypass the chains, meaning I could just skip the tunnels and Abella's monstrous form. I was so surprised the game was cool with me doing this that I got a morale second wind and went into town, having a much different visual experience than the old town I'd been familiar with. And when I made my way into the restaurant and headed to the basement, something occurred that was my biggest takeaway from the experience. Here's a scary sentence, Fear and Hunger 2 got me to question my morality with its gameplay mechanics. On the second day, I met a familiar face in the basement. It's Levi, and something's going on with him. It doesn't take long to notice its withdrawal symptoms. There's a shot mark on his arm. When I ask of what, he replies, opium. I offer if there's anything I can do, to which he goes quiet, and this is what began to unsettle me. At this time, Levi is 18 years old. He's been a child soldier since he was 13. It makes a lot of sense how he could develop an addiction to opioids with that kind of battlefield trauma playing a big part in his life. And the narrative dots connect when Karen's comment, the lady with the brown jacket near the train, saying a soldier ran off right when it stopped, so he must know something. I believe he didn't run because of the information, but because he panicked, suffering these symptoms. And here he is, alone during the Festival of Termina, in the basement of a restaurant, his withdrawal symptoms catching up to him. He's in a bad spot and could be an easy target. If he's gonna make it, he needs to be sharp. And my character Stein is a doctor. It's his job to help others, especially those who need his help. But what I did wasn't just for selfless reasons. An additional party member would make my chance of survival way higher. I had just entered the town proper and would need all of the help I could get to progress. An additional party member could double my attack output and split damage from multiple opponents. So after a few minutes of deciding, I morally compromised my beliefs, walk over to Levi, and hand him a syringe. The text saying his offer tempted him is the equivalent of a pummel in emotional damage. He injects it, thanks me for his help, and says he's not feeling well. Is there any chance he could join me? Of course, I respond and Levi becomes part of my team for the rest of the demo. He has an affinity for firearms and starts with a few bullets, but there's also a downside. Because there's two of us, we're going through supplies twice as fast. Food and alcohol to heal hunger and mind respectively would be draining faster, so we have to move quickly, in addition to managing Levi's addiction. While it did feel in character to look after Levi's needs in addition to my own, keeping him topped off on health and curing any conditions, a part of me kept questioning if I did the right thing. He may be better off in the basement, and good intentions do not always guarantee a good result. I know it's a video game and not real, but the roleplaying and experience were so immersing it had me taking the game seriously. That's an incredible feat for a game to accomplish. But I feel a lot better that Levi is with me when I come across the character Pocket Cat. 
a seemingly jovial creature with shocking brutality that makes me cautious, especially when he claims we have met before, eventually saying goodbye and that we'll meet again soon, where he'll have a special deal for me. So we travel further into the- Oh no! After redoing all that stuff, we arrive at the Church of Almer, a gothic architecture chapel with stained glass depicting what I assume is the Almer. While in this chapel, we walk on beams high above, encountering grotesque humanoids, and even more cosmically enhanced people when we reach the basement floor. Our mind bar is constantly depleting in this place, so as soon as I find a key, we book it out of there. Finding an elevator that links back to Old Town, the interconnected map is blowing my mind. And then, after saving my progress, Levi and I make our way to the locked door leading to the sewers. We turn the key, walk inside, and... Oh. The demo's over. Okay. Cool. That is where my experience with the demo ended. My six recorded attempts have a general runtime of six hours in total, and I'm excited to play more. The game is challenging, but in a way that feels manageable. The type where once you learn how something works, you can clear through it with minimal difficulty. The premise is super interesting, the art style is captivating, and I'm really excited to play more and figure it out. I wanted to share this initial experience with you, because this is just one perspective. It feels like an experience where if you and I each played, we would have different playthroughs from player character to items we loot, mechanics, personal struggles, etc. Its setup allows more variety in its playthroughs, especially in solving problems. That bolt cutter moment was so incredible. And I know there's plenty of stuff I missed. An example is that one of the passengers is at the mayor's house on the second day, and I didn't have a key, so I couldn't open it. But I imagine she would have been another party member option. I'll have a link to the full game in the description of this video, and the demo if you're curious and want to give either a try. Originally, I wanted to do a Fear and Hunger 2 Termina video, much like I did with my other videos. But I'll need some more time with the full game before I can properly do it justice. This game is awesome, and besides my algorithm rabbit hole, I don't hear any other people talking about it. So I wanted to highlight this game to help give it the credit it deserves. I can't make any promises when the full game video releases. I'm playing around with it being a Halloween special, but I'll provide updates in the community tab for my channel. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope it was interesting, and I'll see you around. Take care.